the appearance of the Archangel Gabriel at the beginning of the narrative of the Annunciation immediately declares that a rare and important event is occurring, unique, in fact, in the history of the world. Gabriel has already been referred to in the Hebrew Bible, corresponding in broad terms to our Old Testament, and his first significant recorded appearance being to the prophet Daniel. It is in fact Gabriel who explains to Daniel the meaning of his vision, both immediate and longer term. He also appears in other major Jewish writings, such as the Book of Enoch, which are not considered canonical by the Western Church, although accepted by many of the Eastern Orthodox churches with whom we are in brotherhood. Gabriel, alongside Michael, is referred to as the guardian angel of Israel. The use of his name, instead of simply referring in more general terms to a visitation of an angel, clearly identifies that the event and the message are of exceptional importance. <coughs> With the knowledge of his role in revealing the meaning of Daniel's vision, his very presence signifies that this is the time for the destiny of the world to be decided. Mary has, of course, been prepared for her role since before her birth, but her free consent is still required to what is to happening. The opening word of Gabriel's greeting, Kyrie in the Greek translation, is often referred to in English as hail, but should be more correctly be taken, as in the gospel today, as rejoice. Rejoice, Mary, for something so unimaginable is about to happen to you that your joy cannot be contained. Whilst what we know as full of grace, or alternatively so highly favoured, <coughs> signifies that Mary was especially beloved and favoured, that she had been and would continue to be filled with the grace of God in a manner never known before or since. It is this form of address that leads us ultimately to the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, that through her own son's redemption, she herself was born without any hint of original sin. Only thus is she made the appropriate vessel to carry the Son of God. Yet, even so, she had to agree freely to God's plan before it could be carried out. It's perhaps in this that Mary stands out exceptionally. We are told that Mary was deeply disturbed or troubled by the greeting of Gabriel, but there is no sign of the fear and doubt that would affect Zechariah when he in turn is visited by the archangel. The words of Mary's response to the astounding news that she was to give birth her saviour, I am the handmaid of the Lord, should not necessarily be taken as any lowering of status or humbling of herself. It should rather be viewed as an expression of faith and of her total surrender <coughs> to the will of God. It is only in this light that her yes has any true validity. It would have been perfectly possible for God to have sent his son into the world without any human involvement, but he chose to bring him to mankind in a new and most significant way, by giving him a humanity of his own. This requires the willing and loving participation of a mother who would nurture him through his childhood. Our veneration for Mary, often mistaken as worship by others, comes in part at least from the recognition that she not only made the choice, but carried out her role to the limit. The fact that she was only human, but played her role in Christ's incarnation sets her apart from others in a unique and very special way. In spite of this, we should perhaps note the words of the late Orthodox theologian, 
Alexander Schmemann, who wrote that Mary is the great example, not the great exception. Nor is she a historical curiosity found only in biblical writings, but a real living person. No one else, as far as we know, will ever be asked to take on the exact role of Mary again. But she stands as the perfect example of how God can work through the lives of people. Mary's example of obedience and prayerfulness can be an inspiration to us today. <coughs> if we are willing to open our hearts to him. Although Gabriel told Mary a great deal about her future son, how would be great and called the son of the Most High, not everything that happened to him was shared with her in the Annunciation. Nothing was shared with her about Christ's passion, death and resurrection, yet she still stood firm in her support for her son throughout everything continuing with his disciples even after his ascension to heaven. There can be no greater example of love, faithfulness, perseverance and obedience than the Blessed Virgin Mary, then, now, or for time to come. She is, in truth, the mother of the Church, as well as the mother of God. The former title first used by St Ambrose of Milan in the fourth century, reaffirmed <coughs> by Pope Benedict XIV in 1748, Pope Leo XIII in 1885, and more recently by Pope Paul VI. We can but strive to follow the example of Mary and take perhaps some inspiration to Mary, to Mary that the prayer to Mary that concluded the first encyclical of Pope Francis, Lumen Fide. Mary, help our faith, open our ears to hear God's word and recognise his voice and call, awaken in us a desire to follow in his footsteps, to go forth from our own land to receive his promise. Help us to be touched by his love, <coughs> that we may touch him in faith. Help us to entrust ourselves fully to him and to believe in his love, especially in times of trial beneath the shadow of the cross, when our faith is called to mature. So in our faith, the joy of the risen one reminds us that those who believe are never alone. Teach you to see all things with the eyes of Jesus, that it may be a light for our path. And may this light of faith always increase in us until the door which is Christ himself, our Son, our Lord, is with us once again. This prayer could have been written for the times in which we now stand. We are in times of trial. A cross overshadows us, yet Christ is with us. His light is there for our path. Many of us are alone in these times of trial, but we are never truly alone because God, through Christ, is with us. His spirit is with us wherever may, we may be whatever our circumstances. An ordinary young girl, betrothed to a carpenter, became, through obedience to God and his will in her life, the mother of Christ and the Israel of salvation. If we could even begin to emulate her example of love of God, this can change the world through us and continue the mission of Christ. Through all who believe in him, they may be saved wherever we may be in these times of pandemic, in this suddenly bereft Christmas, the love of Christ is with us. We can share with each other in any way we can and rejoice that Christ has saved the world. In the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.